the purpose of what I've done with this document is to put together a questionnaire list that will assess for any computerized system using electronic records and signatures the specific parts of the regulation that actually are going to apply to your system. Within the document that we're going to get into in a minute, there are nine specific sections that each trace back to very detailed specific parts of the actual 21 CFR Part 11 regulation. Next slide. Here you can see that the questionnaire document that we're getting into has nine specific sections. On the left, you see the sections numbered one to nine. On the right, you see the specific parts of 21 CFR Part 11 that they're going to reference. Sections one, two, and three are for electronic records, whether it's for a closed system or an open system, and I'll define that for you in a minute. Section four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine have to do with electronic signatures, and it talks about um, technical controls, procedural controls. Next slide. Once again, the scope of the document is to allow you to do assessment for 21 CFR Part 11 compliance for any computerized system. Next slide. This is where I want to get into explaining to the audience what I mean by closed system. A closed system is a system that has limited user access to actually get into the system and make any types of changes. It's very restrictive. An open system, on the other hand, has allowing the user to make all types of changes, and that's why it's called an open system. Biometric authentication is a way that you can identify who you are by using something like a fingerprint or a retina scan. And my example is when you go to the clear at the airport, you can stick your fingers on a keypad or you can use a retina scan to authenticate who you are with information stored in a database. That's biometric. Non-biometric, in fact, uses information that you know or only have access to, such as a password or a smart card. There's a new thing on the internet now where they use non-biometric authentication by showing you a series of photos on a screen, and they might ask you to, to identify all the photos of cars, and this proves that you know what the cars are, and it's a non-biometric authentication methodology. Next slide. All right, this is where the document starts to get very specific. There's five different questions that are here. And based on the question's response as a yes or no, it will tell you the specific sections within the document to go to. So you're not going to do all, all nine sections. So with the first one, if it's electronic records for a closed system, you go to section one and two only of this document. The second one, if it's electronic records for an open system, you do sections one, two, and three only. If the system is using non-biometric electronic signatures, you do four, five, six, seven sections of the document only. If the system does not use biometric electronic signatures with tokens, you go to section four, five, and eight only. And finally, if the system uses biometric signatures, you would go to sections four, five, and nine. Next slide. So now what I want to do is show you for each of these sections that this list, the specific regulation within 21 CFR Part 11 that applies. And what I'm going to do is read you the specific questions that are under each of these. And you would answer yes, no, or not applicable. So for 1110A and valid records, the first question is, the system must be able to detect invalid records were applicable such as invalid field entries, fields left blank that should contain data values outside of the limits. Second question for 1110A, the system must be able to detect that a record was altered since its last approval. Then for 1110B, it must be possible to view the entire contents of the records. Again, for 1110B, it must be possible to print the entire contents of the records. Again, for 1110B, it must be possible to generate all the records electronically 
in a format that can be put on a portable medium such as a diskette or CD or transferred electronically. Now for 1110C, if data is archived off the system, the metadata audit trail must be archived off as well. Again, for 1110C, archived data and metadata must be accurately retrieved even after system upgrades are done. Again, 1110C records must be protected against intentional or accidental modification or deletion. Then for 1110D, the system must allow different levels of access based on user responsibility, such as regular user administrator if appropriate. 1110E for electronic audit trails. Electronic audit trails must be automatically generated for the creation, modification, and deletion of records, but are not required for non-essential automated background recording, such as internal buffers, data swap file, and temporary files. Again, for 1110E, electronic audit trails must be completely outside the control and access of users, except for read-only access of the audit trail file. 1110E, again, it must be impossible for the user to disable the audit trail function. Again, for 1110E, electronic audit trails must include full operator name, date stamp, time stamp, and reason, which indicates the record creation, modification, or deletion reason. Again, for 1110E, the date and time used in the electronic audit trail must be protected from unauthorized change. 1110E, again, when data is changed or deleted, all previous values must be electronically available. 1110E, again, electronic audit trails must be protected from accidental or intentional modification or deletion read-only access. 1110E, again, electronic audit trails must be maintained and retrievable for at least as long as its respective electronic records. 1110E again, electronic audit trails must be readily available for inspections and audits. 1110E again, electronic audit trails must be able to be viewed again. Electronic audit trails must be able to be extracted in a transportable electronic format that can be read by regulatory agencies. 1110F, if sequence steps are required, the system must ensure that the actions are performed in the correct sequence. 1110G, the system must ensure that only authorized individuals can use it. 1110H, if it is a requirement that data input or instructions only come from specific input devices such as instruments or terminals, the system must check for the correct device. Next slide. This next section has to do with electronic records for closed system procedural controls. And once again, I'm gonna read you a series of specific questions that will trace back to the regulations that you see on the slide. 1110A for validation procedure. The system must be validated per company procedure to provide documented evidence that the system ensures accuracy, reliability, and consistent intended performance. The following documents provide validation documentation. System requirements document, detailed design specification document, computerized system validation decision form, validation plan, traceability matrix, installation qualification protocol, operational qualification protocol, performance qualification protocol, test failure reporting and resolution, installation qualification report, operational qualification report, Performance Qualification Report, Validation Summary Report, Procedures, Hardware Installation and Software Installation Procedures, Change Control for Hardware, Software, and System Documentation. 1110C, Electronic, and must include Backup and Recovery Procedures, Disaster Recovery Procedures. 1110C again, Archival and Recovery, must address regeneration of storage media. 1110D, logical security must exist and include the following, physical security, vendor assessment, training, application operation, application administration, application support and maintenance, system administration, system shutdowns. Again, for 1110D, access levels must be documented and controlled. 1110D again, access levels must be approved 
by management of the user and by the system owner before assignment to a user. 1110D again, a procedure for granting access to a new user for changing privileges from an existing user and for deleting user accounts from the system must exist. 1110I, documentation that shows persons who develop the system have the education, training, and experience to perform their assigned tasks, including temporary and contract staff must exist. 1110I again, documentation that shows persons who maintain the system have the education, training, and experience to perform their assigned tasks, including temporary and contract staff must exist. 1110I again, Documentation that shows persons who use the system have the education, training, and experience to perform their assigned tasks, including temporary and contract staff, must exist. 1110K1, the distribution of access to and use of system documentation must be limited to authorized and adequately trained personnel. 1110K2, a system documentation change control procedure to maintain an audit trail, either electronic or paper that documents modifications must exist. 11.70, if handwritten signatures are executed to electronic records, the handwritten signatures must be linked to the electronic records. 11.70 again, if handwritten signatures are executed to electronic records and the electronic record is changed, the signer must be prompted to re-sign via manual procedures. That completes sections one and two for electronic records for closed system. And then for electronic records for an open system, you would complete sections one and two that I just did. And in addition, you would do section three, which is specific for electronic records uh, for an open system. So for, for number three, section three, 11.3, electronic records can, has control such as appropriate. 1130 again, controls must exist that ensure record authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality is maintained. 1130 again, data must be encrypted. Next slide. The next sections are going to be section four, five, six, seven, and these will specifically relate to systems that use non-biometric electronic signatures. So starting here with electronic signatures, general technical controls, 11.50a, electronically signed records must contain the following information associated with the signing. Full name of the signer, date stamp, time stamp, meaning of signature. 11.50b, it must be impossible for the user to disable the audit trail function. 11.50b, electronic audit trails must be protected from accidental or intentional modification or deletion. 11.10b, electronic audit trails must be maintained and retrievable for at least as long as its respective electronic records. 11.50b, electronic audit trails must be readily available for inspections and audits. 11.50b, electronic audit trails must be able to be viewed and printed by inspectors. 11.50b, electronic audit trails must be able to be extracted in a transportable electronic format that can be read by regulatory agencies. 11.50b, the system must allow only the original signer to delete the electronic signature. 11.50b, a system generated audit trail must be created whenever a signature is deleted from a transaction. 11.50b, the full name of the signer, date stamp, time stamp, and the meaning of the signature must appear in every human readable form of the electronic record for all screens and printed reports. 11.50G, the system must verify that an individual has the authority to electronically sign a record before allowing the person to do so. 11.70, electronic signatures must be automatically linked via the computer system to their corresponding electronic records to ensure that the signature cannot be excised, copied, or otherwise transferred to falsify an electronic record by ordinary means. 11.70, electronic signatures and signature links to electronic records must be maintained for as long as the record exists to which the signature applies since it's maintained. Next slide. This is section five, electronic signatures, general procedure controls, and this is still part of 
the section for non-biometric electronic signatures. 1110J, a procedure that holds individuals fully accountable and responsible for actions initiated under their electronic signature must exist. 11.100A, each individual signature must electronic signatures must never be reused or reassigned to anyone other than the original owner. 1110A, use of another individual's electronic signature is prohibited even if the individual authorizes such use. 1110B, each person's identity must be adequately verified prior to issuing an electronic signature. 11.100B, a procedure for verifying the requester's identity when reissuing passwords must exist. 11.100C2, individuals having electronic signature privileges will certify the legal equivalence of their signature with a handwritten signature. 11.100C2, records of user certifications will be maintained. Next slide. This is another section six that also goes back to non-biometric electronic signatures. 11.200A1, Non-biometric electronic signatures must be made up of at least two distinct ID components, such as an ID code and password. 11.200A1I, two or more non-biometric electronic signature components must be required for the initial signing if continuous signing sessions are used. Where the initial login to the system requires an identification code and password, this initial login may be considered the first signing. 11.200A1II, if only one non-biometric electronic signature component is required for subsequent signings, the private component must only be known to and only be accessible by its owner for subsequent signings. The user must be required to stay in close proximity to the workstation for the entire session. An automatic log off must occur or a password protected screensaver must launch after a short period of inactivity with the password were known only by the one used on I. For non-biometric electronic signatures, when a user leaves the workstation, uncontrolled system access must be limited through the use of automatic timeout and password security measures. If single session security cannot be maintained, each signing must be required for all components of the electronic signature. 11.300A. Password files must be encrypted or otherwise secured so passwords cannot be read by ordinary means, including system administrators. 11.300b, passwords must periodically expire and be revised. 11.300d, repeated attempts at unauthorized system use via a non-biometric signature must result in automatic disabling of the electronic signature. 11.300d, any attempts to any unauthorized use of non-biometric electronic signatures must be detected and reported immediately to the system security unit and as appropriate to organizational management. Next section. This is the last section for non-biometric electronic signatures, 11.200A2. Non-biometric electronic signatures must be used only by their genuine owners or, and cannot be loaned to co-workers or supervisors for any reason. 11.200A3, non-biometric electronic signatures must be administered and executed so that unauthorized use requires the collaboration of two or more individuals. 11.300A, controls must be in place to maintain the uniqueness of each combined ID code and password so that no two individuals can have the combination of ID code and password. 11.300A controls must be in place to prevent 300A. Passwords must not be disclosed for troubleshooting or loan to another individual. 11.300B, a procedure for recalling ID codes and passwords when people leave or are transferred must exist. 11.300D, a procedure for investigating attempted security violations must exist. Next slide. This slide specifically goes back to the question, does the system use non-biometric electronic signatures with tokens? For that, you would go through section four and five, which I've already read, so I'm not gonna reread that. 
And then in addition to section four and five, you would do this section eight, electronic signatures, non-biometric with, with token controls. 11.300A, a procedure directing action to be taken to electronically deauthorize lost, stolen, missing, or otherwise potentially compromised tokens, cards, and other devices used to carry or generate electronic signature components and for managing and controlling temporary and or permanent token card replacements must exist. 11.300E, a procedure addressing the initial and periodic testing of devices such as tokens or cards that bear or generate ID codes or password information must exist. The test must include checking for proper functioning, performance degradation, and possible unauthorized use. Next slide. This slide goes back to the question, does the system use biometric signatures? You would do section four and five, like you would with the other, other question about non-biometric electronic signatures with, with tokens. And then in addition, you would do this section nine electronic signature biometric technical controls. So with this one, 11 dollars must be designed to ensure that only their genuine owners can use them. Also for 11.200B, biometric controls must not re rely on repetitive actions alone, such as typing an ID code and password or writing a signature on an electronic stylus pad unless additionally identifying.